History tells the story of the world and of our lives. Sometimes that history goes bump in the night. Broadcasting from the center of oddity and the supernatural in Central Florida, it's the History Goes Bump podcast. Hello, you spectacular people. Welcome to this 66th episode of the History Ghost Bump podcast. Ghost tours for the theater of the mind. I am your host, Diane. And this is Denise. And in today's episode, we're going to be presenting to you the Ohio State Reformatory. This is one of those places that they call reformatory that I don't think it was really about reforming anyone. It's like reformatory equals torture and treat badly, really badly. Now, for a lot of our listeners, if you watch a lot of the paranormal shows that are out there that are the reality TV shows on cable, you probably have heard of the Ohio State Reformatory because nearly all of them have made a visit to this location. Because, Denise, it is the most haunted reformatory in the what United States or world. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know, but they consider it to be one of the most haunted locations, definitely in Ohio, probably in this country as well. So there's a lot of stuff going on there, a lot of history we're looking forward to sharing with you guys. But before we get into that, we do want to point you at our website, historygoesbump.com. It has everything you could possibly need in order to get involved more with the show, whether it's where you can listen to the show, how you can catch up with us on social media. Our archives are up there. You can also find the blog, which has all of our show notes. You can sign up for the newsletter, and you can also donate to the show. And Denise, if they want to send us some feedback, how can they do that? They can email us at historygoesbump at gmail.com. And Denise, as a matter of fact, we did get some feedback from one of our listeners, April. She had listened to the St. Valentine's Day Massacre episode, and she wanted to give us an update on that. So I just want to share her email with everyone. I just discovered your podcast, and I'm so glad I did. I love watching the ghost documentaries on TV, but I've always been far more interested in the history behind the actual ghosts than I am the experiences of the people who saw them and the investigations. So your podcast is exactly what I've been hoping to find. I've been marathoning through your past episodes and was so excited when I listened to the one you did on the St. Valentine's Day Massacre because I actually have something to add to it. You mentioned the podcast not knowing where the wall from the massacre ended up after Patey owned it. I don't know if anyone else has told you since the podcast aired, but the remaining bricks Patey had were given to his niece as an inheritance. She later sold them to the Mob Museum in Las Vegas. I got to see it last year on a trip there with my family. It is not the complete wall, but still eerie to see as the bullet holes are easily visible, along with blood stains, real or fake, I don't know, but creepy nonetheless. The theory of the bricks being cursed and spirits attached to objects makes me wonder if there's been any reported hauntings at the museum itself, with all of the mob memorabilia housed there. Love the podcast, and I can't wait to listen to more. Keep up the good work. I just want to also say thank you, April. That was really neat getting an update on something we didn't know. So thank you for sharing. Yeah, we didn't even know there was such a thing as the Mob Museum. Now I want to go see it. Oh, absolutely. So guess what we've added to the list? (laughs) Why don't we tell everybody a little bit about the museum? Absolutely. So it was formerly a federal courthouse and post office and was built in 1933. The courthouse was one of 14 used to go after organized crime in the 50s. The courtroom has been restored and it was bought in 2002 for one dollar. That's right, one dollar, because the state basically bought it. The courthouse, it was just sitting there, and they didn't know what they were going to do with it, and they thought, we had all this interesting history that happened inside of it with all these court cases against these mob bosses, and we have all this memorabilia, why don't we turn it into a museum? And so that's why there was, the one dollar is a legal thing, you have to at least sell something for a buck, so that's why they did that, and then they got it restored, and it looks really neat, because of course it looks like your standard courthouse on the outside, and then inside it's got all this great stuff in the museum. And as a matter of fact, uh, we wanted to see if we could find out anything about haunted items, because April made a great point. I wonder, since you guys said that these bricks could be cursed, is that true? And think about it, this mob museum has not just like uh, somebody's suit or whatever. It has the weapons that were used. It has these bricks from the wall. There's all kinds of stuff in there. So any of these things could possibly have an attachment. I did a lot of digging yesterday. Could not find anything in regards to it other than some guy who posted a video that calls him, say, a Vegas Bob or something. And the title of it was Ghost of Bugsy Siegel at the Mob Museum. And I thought, oh, perfect. This might be something. And then when I watched it, it was just basically him outside ranting and raving about how they wouldn't let him take a camera in. And 
And then he said, and so I went and looked on his website, and he had a comment there that said, well, if you, on one of the parts where I zoom in, you can see a shadow that's Bugsy Siegel. And I'm like, well, first of all, how would you even know that that's who that is if it's a shadow type thing? And I looked at the video over and over again, and I saw absolutely nothing. So I don't know what he was talking about. It's a, a misleading title there. So we didn't find anything, but I did think that it was a fascinating look at inside of the museum. MSNBC went in with one of their reporters when it was getting ready to open. And we do have that video up in our show notes for this show, if you guys want to check that out. I thought it was a really interesting video to get to see what was inside the museum. Yeah, and so someday we want to go do it in person, as Diane already said. We had some other people join us at the Spooky Crew. Woohoo! We'd like to welcome Patrick. Hey, Patrick. And most of you probably already know Patrick. He is Patrick Keller of the Big Seance Podcast. So I guess he figured out after being with us twice on the show that he might join the Spooktacular Crew. <laughs> Thanks for finally getting on board, Patrick. And for those of you who don't already know, we were on Patrick's show, The Big Sands Podcast. And I think what I'll do is probably put a link to that also in the show notes. And we've got it up on Facebook. And if you follow us on Twitter, it's all up in those places. We also had Jill join us. Hey, welcome, Jill. And Conrad. And Conrad, welcome to you as well. And we also got three more five-star reviews over at iTunes. The first one is from Suzuvumf. Okay, I'll just go ahead and spell it. It's S-Z-Q-W-M-V. Lots of fun and spooky, too. A carefree romp through all things spooky. Love it. Thank you. Yes, thank you. And I won't even try that. The next one is by Phoenix STZ. At Sticks. Hey, I like that band. I'm a history buff who loves any paranormal story associated with a time, place, or person. So this podcast is very entertaining to me. Great job, ladies. I hope you make it to San Antonio soon. You could spend a week here and find enough material for an entire month. Jill. Thank you, Jill. I believe that's one of our new Spooky Crew members. Yes, it is. And Berated Lime. Who would berate a lime? I like lime. Wrote, creepy and fun. Every year around this time, I go looking for creepy podcasts to get me in the Halloween spirit. I came across this one the other day, and it absolutely does the trick. I love the mix of history and paranormal even better. The hosts are passionate about the content they put out. History can tend toward the dry side, but the hosts seem to have perfected the combo of history and entertainment. Another plus is that the podcast is entirely listener supported, so you don't have to sit through or forward through 15 minutes of lame adverts. I'm having a blast going through the archives. Well, thank you so much, Berated Lime. Yes, thank you. We greatly appreciate that. And of course, we do love having the show as listener supported because as a fellow podcast listener, I know that's what I do. I just fast forward through the ads because I get sick of listening to it. It kind of reminds me, Denise, of cable. You remember when cable first came out, it wasn't supposed to have commercials. That's why you were paying for it. Mm -hmm. So I kind of look at podcasts as the same thing. That's why it's better than radio. You don't get a bunch of ads. Exactly. Are you ready to go into the reformatory? I am. Here we go. Become an executive producer of the History Goes Bump podcast for as little as a buck a month. For $5 a month, you can access exclusive content like the Haunted True Crime bonus cast. And for $10 and above a month, you get all that plus awesome History Goes Bump gear. Check out patreon.com slash history goes bump for more information. Or you can give us a one-time donation by clicking the donate button at historygoesbump.com. The year was 1803 and superstitions ran strong in the Hammersmith District of London. Many people started coming forward and complaining to authorities that a ghost had been harassing them near the Hammersmith graveyard. Rumors circulated that the ghost must belong to someone at unrest in the graveyard because its body had been buried in consecrated ground. The belief at that time was that if someone committed suicide, they could not be buried in consecrated ground or the soul would not rest. Thus, the culprit of these harassments must be the spirit of a suicide victim. An excise officer by the name of Francis Smith decided to take matters into his own hands and he hid outside the graveyard waiting for the ghost to appear. Why he thought a bullet would kill a ghost is beyond our understanding. Sure enough, the ghost appeared and Smith fired his gun. The ghost fell over dead. And as you probably already guessed, the ghost Smith saw was actually a real man. He was a plasterer named Thomas Millwood, and he was wearing the customary white shirt, pants, and apron of a plasterer. Smith was arrested and tried, and although he argued that he only shot because he thought Millwood was a ghost, 
He was found guilty and sentenced to hang. The king later commuted the sentence to hard labor. It was some time later when an elderly shoemaker came forward and admitted that he was the Hammersmith ghost. Apparently, he would wear a white sheet because he wanted to scare his apprentice, who had in turn been scaring the elderly shoemaker's children with ghost stories. Now that certainly is odd. You're not afraid of a little ghost, are you? This Day in History On this day, September 7th in 1497, a sailor by the name of Perkin Warbeck is declared to be Richard IV on Bodwin Moor in Cornwall. The only problem is that Perkin is not part of the monarchy. Perkin's true past is cloudy, but he would claim after being in prison that he was born to a Flemish father. Perkin first claimed the English throne in 1490. He had been traveling with a merchant and had put on some of the fine silk clothing the merchant sold. When the people of York saw him in the clothing, Perkin claimed they demanded that he pretend to be the younger son of King Edward IV in order to get revenge on the king. Perkin tells people that he is Richard of Shrewsbury and that he has been absent because he and his brother Edward V had been captured. His brother had been killed, but the captors let him go if he promised to hide his identity for seven years. The aunt of the real Richard backed Perkin and he gained more support. King Henry VII knew that Perkin was an imposter, though, and he complained to other royals. After officially being declared King Richard IV on September 7th, Perkin put together a Cornish army and went after King Henry VII. When Perkin heard of Henry VII's forces, he became fearful and abandoned his army. King Henry captured him and threw him into the Tower of London, where he would confess to being a pretender. He later escaped twice and was finally drawn in Tyburn, where he read a confession. Tyburn was the principal place for executions at that time. After reading the confession, Perkin was hanged. The History Goes Bump Podcast. Sometimes a place is needed to help with reforming young people when they wander down the wrong road in life. That is what the Ohio State Reformatory was originally meant to do, help wayward young men get back on the right road. The beautiful Gothic Reformatory built of iron and limestone is so picturesque that it was used as a location in the movie The Shawshank Redemption. But what happened to many of the residents of this building was anything but beautiful and certainly not about truly reforming young men. Stories that include torture, beatings, and other misdeeds are numerous. And wherever strong emotions are built up, we usually find some kind of unexplained phenomenon. Come with us as we venture inside the Ohio State Reformatory. Mansfield, Ohio was established in 1808 by three men, Joseph Larwell, Jacob Newman, and James Hedges. The town was right near a fork in the Mohican River. The Surveyor General of the United States at that time was Jared Mansfield, and the residents decided that Mansfield would be a fitting name for their town since he had helped with the plotting. In 1846, a railroad line was built in Mansfield that traveled to Sandusky, and the town really began to flourish and grow at that time. Hudson Rotor and Company was a major cigar company that based itself in Mansfield, and by 1888 it was the largest employer in town. Other manufacturing in Mansfield produced paper boxes, linseed oil, brass objects, doors, and even suspenders. In a field in Mansfield, a training area was set up for Civil War soldiers in 1861. The camp was named Camp Mordecai Bartley after the governor of the state who served in the 1840s. In 1867, it was decided that the area would be perfect for the intermediate penitentiary. That is the name that the reformatory would originally go by. It was named intermediate because it was meant to be a midway stop between the Boys Industrial School in Lancaster and the state penitentiary in Columbus. This was a place for first-time offenders. The city of Mansfield and the state of Ohio worked together to purchase 180 acres of land. They spent over $1.3 million to construct the facility. So you think if this is a midway stop and you're trying to catch kids after they've had that first-time offense, that you would actually do stuff that might be more constructive and reformatory? <laughs> That's not what's going to happen. And no kidding. It's like this is a definite example of when 
bad things make bad people worse. <laughs> I mean, the problem is there are some people in jail that you should just leave them there to rot. I don't care what happens to them. There's others that you probably could make a difference in their lives. Unfortunately, we end up having a lot of people who go through jail that come out hardened criminals is what they call them because they just get hardened when they're in jail. They work out so they get bigger and beefier and meaner. And then you put them back out on the streets and they've got a chip on their shoulder. Well, and it's survival of the fittest in the penitentiary system. So you have to be definitely become a bit of a bad, a bad A. <laughs> I was going to say, you're going to use that word? No, Miss, it's a G, this is a G-rated show. It is a G-rated show. And I didn't use that word. I used the initial but yeah, so in, in this, like you said, for first time offenders for young boys, you know, you might want to give them a chance to reform, especially <laughs> if you're called a reformatory, but no. And in my research, I didn't find this out. So I don't know what kinds of things they were thrown in jail for. I'm hoping that it wasn't for the same kind of stuff that we would found out with the European jails where they were throwing kids in with adults for stealing bread or something. The architect for the reformatory was a local Cleveland architect by the name of Levi T. Schofield. Schofield went all in and decided on not just one architectural design, but three of them. These styles were Queen Anne, Victorian Gothic, and Richardsonian Romanesque, leading many to think that the reformatory is chateau-like in appearance. And it is indeed a beautiful building. It looks like a castle on the outside. I know it's absolutely gorgeous. And I think that's kind of the look they were going for, was more of a castle look. I guess so they could hide their nastiness behind beauty. I guess. You know what, though? That kind of makes sense because sometimes really beautiful people are really ugly inside and you don't know it until you're already trapped. <laughs> well, here's some of the thinking that they had. Many who were involved in the creation of the gel hoped that the structure would somehow inspire those that were locked within to change their lives and turn from their quote unquote sinful life to a spiritual one. They probably did turn to a spiritual one, as we'll soon talk about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't think that spiritual is what they were talking about. <laughs> Another architect named F.F. F. Schnitzer completed the construction and became the first superintendent of the reformatory. Okay, so how do you put kind of a little bit rough boys in a facility and then expect them not to giggle at a name like Schnitzer? You know what? I had a biology teacher and that was her last name was Schnitzer. Did people laugh? And she said, hello, I'm a snitch, snitcher. I don't know if we did or not. Oh, well. Some people pet- might have taken the C away and called it in the N and called it something else that's not G-rated. Schnitzer. <laughs> okay, you lost me, but that's okay. Our listeners are probably right with you. <laughs> <laughs> the cornerstone was laid on November 4th, 1886 with Schnitzer's name on it. So it's on there for all time and eternity. Even before it was finished, the structure changed names. And in 1891, it became officially known as the Ohio State Reformatory. The East Wing became known for its unique cell block structure. The cell block was built from steel and rose six tiers and was amazingly freestanding. The only cell block in the world to be freestanding at that height. The doors officially opened in September 1896, even though construction would continue until 1910. As a matter of fact, a lot of the young boys that they brought in there, they forced them to finish the construction. So there was a wall that was built up around the place. They made them finish that. So it was definitely hard labor they were coming into. And 150 young men were the first occupants. Life in the reformatory was similar to full-blown prison, with boys creating shanks and shivs. Violence between inmates was very high. The 1930s would see such an influx of first-time offenders that the prison became overcrowded. Most of the staff lived at the reformatory as well. Inmates claimed that the place was overrun by rats and disease. The food was unpalatable. Sweat boxes were used to punish mainly black prisoners. The worst place to go was the hole. You know, a lot of prisons called their places the hole. They did. So it wasn't a very unique name, and it makes a lot of sense because we don't know this for sure. But I would assume what else would have been a hole that you can think of back in some of the other podcasts that we've done would be the that part of the dungeon that they would throw people down into mm-hmm. the hole and they were just left there to rot. Yeah. So then they equated probably the terminology became for these these prison cells, which these prison cells were solitary confinement cells and inmates sometimes had to sleep on the concrete floors. I know in the winter that would be that would be hell because Ohio is not very warm in the winter at no. all. Following a riot, 120 inmates were thrown into the hole. That's a lot of men having to share only 20 cells. They were forced to stay in there for 30 days. One inmate was murdered during the punishment. In 1948, a prison farmer and his family were murdered by an inmate. Yeah, so that would be about six inmates per cell, and these cells could barely hold one person. I I don't think they could have all laid down at the same time. 
No, they probably either had to take turns or have some sort of, I don't know. The Boyd consent decree was issued by a judge in 1986 after several lawsuits about the inhumane conditions that the reformatory were brought before him. The decree ordered the facility to be closed and another structure was built to the west. That opened as the Mansfield Correctional Institute. The doors to the Ohio State Reformatory closed officially on December 31, 1990, and in its time, the reformatory had housed over 155,000 men. That's a lot. That's a, a very lot. 200 of them died during incarceration. That's a lot out of 155,000, and this is supposed to be a midway point. <laughs> I know this isn't even full-blown prison, although it does. we did say it was treated as such. Yeah, it became that, basically. This number does not include the deaths of non-inmates at the facility. The facility is now run by the Mansfield Reformatory Preservation Society and tours are conducted from April through September. It becomes a haunted attraction during the Halloween season. And if you look that up, you Google Ohio State Reformatory, you can see all of the tour hours. I know September 1st is the end, so it is closed for the season as of the recording in 2015 that we're doing. And then the haunted attraction, it's supposed to be like the witching hour or something this year. So it has that up at the top there as well. So you can find that if you guys are in the area and looking for something where you can pay money to be spooked. That would be one of them. Yes. And if you do go, um, be sure to email us and let us know because we would love to hear about your own personal experiences. The reformatory not only gained fame being used as a location in films, it has also been investigated by several reality TV paranormal shows. These include My Ghost Story, Paranormal Challenge, Ghost Hunters, Ghost Hunters Academy, Ghost Adventures, Scariest Stories on Earth, Scariest Places on Earth, and Ghost Asylum. The reason for so many appearances on paranormal shows is that the Ohio State Reformatory is considered to be one of the most haunted places in America, as we've already said. (laughs) Warden Arthur Lewis Glatke was a hard man. He served as warden from 1935 to 1959. He and his wife, Helen, lived in the administration wing. It was in 1950 that his wife, Helen, died in that wing after an accidental gunshot. She apparently was reaching into a jewelry box when the gun went off. She contracted pneumonia while recovering and died three days after the accident. Was it truly an accident or had the warden killed his wife? Some believed the latter. When he later died after having a heart attack in his office... Haunting activity began in the administration wing. Helen wore rose-scented perfume, and it is sometimes smelled in the hallways. She also reportedly likes to visit the library. The warden has been heard in his office saying, quote, catch me if you can, or it could be an inmate saying something to the warden. Pictures have been photographed of what looks like someone sitting in the warden's chair. Sandra experienced the olfactory paranormal sensation in 2007 and wrote of it. Quote, my family toured the Ohio State Reformatory last weekend when we were in the area for another occasion. I didn't know anything about the place before going on the tour. While we were in the area where the warden and his wife used to live, my eight-year-old son was getting tired of listening to the guide, so we started browsing through the rooms alone. We walked into a room, and I immediately started to smell roses. Without saying what I smelled, I asked my son if he could smell anything. He answered, yes, flowers. A moment later, others from the tour walked into the room and the smell instantly disappeared. After the tour, I mentioned my experience to a volunteer at the front desk, and she told me that the warden's wife, Helen, loved roses. When I got home, I started searching online for information about the reformatory. Several links mentioned visitors smelling roses, and it meant that Helen was near. I didn't believe in the supernatural going in. But since I specifically smelled roses without any knowledge of previous stories, I definitely believe now. I didn't want my son to be scared by the experience, so I told him Helen must have liked us because she took the time to say hello to us and left when the others came in, end quote. The chapel is haunted by strange noises and shadowy figures that disappear quickly when spotted. Unusual photographs have been taken inside as well. Occasionally, people claim to feel as though they are being touched by a spider web, even though they have not actually walked through a spider web. Others are scratched or pushed. Disembodied screams are heard in the hallways as if someone were being tortured. The sounds of cell doors slamming shut echoes in the corridors. One of the wayward boys at the reformatory was a 14-year-old boy who was beaten so badly he died. The incident took place in the basement, and it is believed that his spirit now knocks about the place. 
The basement is also where the hole is located. Because of the severe punishments that took place here, anyone who enters claims to feel a certain malevolence, and even glowing eyes have been witnessed. You know, you think of a 14-year-old boy being under their control that was beaten so badly that he died. If you've ever heard any of the stories where people have been beaten to death, that was a heck of a beating. Yeah, I don't know what's worse, burning to death, drowning, or being beaten to death. None of those seem appealing. No, not at all. A woman named Carrie was on a ghost hunt and reported to the website Grave Addiction the following experience. Quote, I just got back from visiting the OSR, and a group of us had an experience in the cell block. The cell that I'm speaking of is the one marked with the X that has been reported to have activity. We were taken back to the block when the tour was over. There were about nine of us along with the guide. We heard someone running. The guide asked who was running because there shouldn't be anyone. Immediately, the cell door slammed shut. It scared us all, and we wasted no time at all getting out of there. The guide was so scared that he was soaking wet with sweat, end quote. It's kind of funny that they put an X there. It's like X marks the spot. (laughs) Here, go by the X's and you'll have paranormal experiences. Exactly. So do some of the past inmates of the Ohio State Reformatory still remain in their cells? Have the intense emotions associated with this place been locked into the stone shell? And do things replay themselves over and over? Is the reformatory haunted? That is for you to decide. And as I was doing the research and looking for a lot of personal experiences, I'd say 60 to 70 percent of the time, When people went into this location, absolutely nothing happened. So people do claim it to be one of the most haunted locations, but it's not a guaranteed something's going to happen here. So it's give or take. I still would like to see it just if for nothing else, the outside of it sounds very, very cool. Well, absolutely. So we have our camper. So as we plan things, we could definitely make a stop there. There's lots of stuff in Ohio. We will have to make a stop there. We've never been, have we? We, we You have. Yeah, we have I've never been. I've actually never even been to Ohio, I don't believe. I've been to Cleveland. Okay. I saw the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Very cool. Our next show is a suggestion from Sparkle City Phil, who is host over at the Hateful Dead podcast. He and his wife made a stop at a location in New York, and it's called Rainham Hall. I hope I said that right. And so we are going to check it out because not only is it an old, cool looking location that has a lot of history involved, but it probably has some hauntings as well. Yeah, apparently there's some bumping going on there. And Phil sent me a bunch of pictures. So we'll have those up in the show notes as well. Very cool. So we'll be doing that on the next show. I hope you enjoyed this one. Thank you for joining us. I have been your host, Diane. And this has been Denise. You take care now. Bye bye. Executive producers for this podcast have been Levi Drescher, Rachel Cooper, Dan Foytick, Janice Carlson, Patty Hunt, Stephen Pappas, Jade Lewis, Heather Williams, and Leanna Sapien. Thank you. Check out the website at historygoesbump.com.